Welcome to the All of Christ for All of Life podcast, where we equip men and women to be faithful in every aspect of life. This week, you will hear Pastor Douglas Wilson's talk, The Black Regiment, from our audio collection titled, American War for Independence. Let's thank the Lord together. Our Father and God, we thank you for the time that we have here today. I pray that you give us clear minds and clean hearts as we think through this uh, material. Uh, we pray that we would not only be able to learn things, but what is oftentimes most difficult for us, which is to unlearn things and to relearn things. Father, I pray you'd help us uh, with this important task, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, the talk here is on the Black Regiment, which you might wonder, uh, and you might wonder what that refers to. The the theme of this conference is the War for Independence, the American War for Independence, and various men and battles uh, in that war. And it is a very important uh, period in our history, uh, defining and shaping and molding much of what was to follow. The title for this talk comes from a Tory um, let me begin with uh, some terminology. You may be f familiar with the fact that uh, loyalists to the crown, Americans at the time of the American War for Independence who were loyal to the crown were called Tories. And this, uh, this designation came from names for political parties in England. In England, there were Tories and Whigs. And uh, the original name for Tory probably came from uh, a nickname for Irish Catholic thugs. And the name Whig probably originally came from a nickname for Scottish thugs. And so these uh, two examples of thuggery became the names of political parties in um, England. And, uh, and then over here in the colonies, uh, the, uh, the men fighting the uh, crown, those who were American patriots, uh, commonly refer, referred to themselves as Whigs. So they, they, that's rarely noted today, but they were Whigs. They thought of themselves as um, Whigs. And you have to keep your eye on the ball as you work through history because uh, the designations of different political parties um, don't... Uh, the, the names r remain the same, but oftentimes everybody switches position, like halftime at a football game, where you, you're working in opposite... Uh, directions. So at the time of the American Revolution, uh, the Whig Party was the party that favored decentralized government, independence from the crown, and by the time of the, um, the Whig Party in America blew up shortly before the, the formation of the modern Republican Party, the Republican Party under Lincoln replaced the Whigs. The Whigs, by that time, favored centralized government and uh, internal improvements and that sort of thing. So uh, you can't get names and, and names and phrases and terminology to stay put as you work through history. But at the, in the 17th century, excuse me, in the 18th century, at the time of the American War for Independence, the, the Whigs were colonists uh, who were fighting the crown. The Tories were those who were... Uh, in uh, uh, loyal to, to King George. So the title for this talk comes from a Tory who was writing in 1781. Uh, this man was named Peter Oliver, and he wrote to rebuke, quote, the black regiment, the dissenting clergy, for fomenting the revolution. He was referring to the black gowns or robes worn by Presbyterian ministers. The black regiment was referring to sort of an, an additional force for American independence, which was consisted of Presbyterian clergymen who almost to a man were in favor of the uh, revolt against the crown. And as we'll see, this revolt against the crown was not really a revolt. One of the things that we have to get fixed in our minds is everything that you were told about the revolution is not necessarily what was going on at the time of the, the revolution. For example, uh, the great conservative statesman, Edmund Burke, who was one of the most far-sighted people, identifying the nature and direction of the French Revolution long before it became manifest in the Reign of Terror, Edmund Burke was death on the French Revolution from the beginning. He, he, he saw where it was going. He saw the radical principle involved. He saw that it was, in current terminology, a radical left-wing movement. It was a, it was a radical uh, egalitarian 
movement and identified it as such. But Edmund Burke was entirely in favor of the American war for independence. He, he approved of what the case the colonists were making, and he saw that the American revolutionaries were not revolutionaries at all, but counter-revolutionaries. The revolution had occurred in England, in English politics, and the American uh, colonial forces were fighting to protect the old English constitution, which had been, in effect, overthrown through political events in uh, England, beginning with the glorious revolution of 16. 16- 88. The American War for Independence, which I think is a better way of expressing it, um, at the time it was called the American Revolution, it was called the Revolution, but revolution did not mean at that time what it came to mean later, after the French Revolution and the Russian Revolution and so forth. Um, at the time, it, it was simply referring to a transition in government. It later took on the radical uh, connotations that the French Revolution and the Russian Revolution gave it. One of the best things we can do is simply start calling it the American War for Independence, because that is, that's a far more descriptive term for it. This American War for Independence was preached and um, encouraged in a profound way by Presbyterian clergymen. I don't mean to leave out um, the Baptists, uh, who ha- had a small but significant role and the Congregationalists in New England. But as we will see, the Presbyterian um, impact on this war was monumental. You're, you're going to discover in short order that this talk and the other talks uh, of this conference are a prime example of holding that the American states were Christian commonwealths in their foundings and that the United States was a Christian federal republic in its founding. Let me say that again. The the colonies were Christian commonwealths in their founding when they were established um, as colonies of England or when they were acquired by England. For example, the Dutch plantation in New York was taken over by the English and so on. But it was, uh, these were uh, Christian commonwealths in their founding and they continued that characteristic as Christian commonwealths after Uh, independence from Great Britain was attained, and that the United States was a Christian federal republic when it was founded. And I want to argue, because it was a Christian federal republic when it was founded, and it's a constitutional form of government, that means uh, that that has ramifications down to the present. If it was a Christian republic, that means it is a Christian republic. And our disobedience our covenant breaking doesn't alter the existence of the covenant. More about that later. This view, the view that America, excuse me, the view that the uh, separate states were Christian commonwealths in their founding, and the view that the United States was a Christian federal republic in its founding, need only be advanced uh, or stated, merely stated, in order to have the scorn, full scorn, of scholarly opinion heaped upon it. And so let me, beginning, let me begin by noting what this view does not entail. What am I not saying? What am I not claiming when I say that the United States was and is a Christian republic? This does not mean, first, this does not mean that every last person in America in the 18th century was born again. We are not talking about some sort of golden age utopia. America is not a savior. It is not a savior nation. It is, uh, 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 many scholars write and have expended a great deal of energy talking about and writing about American exceptionalism. Um, And oftentimes this gets mixed into some sort of messianic notion that American exceptionalism has some sort of, uh, is going to bring some sort of salvation to the world. Well, there are exceptional things about America, just like just as there are exceptional things about every other nation. All, all nations are exceptional. All nations um, have their own distinctive features. But to the extent that American exceptionalism, ex- exceptionalism uh, represents something godly and good, it's not because America brought the godly and good thing to the world, but rather the, the gospel brought the godly and good things to America, and it was accepted at that time uh, for a time. And we need to recover that. I just want to emphasize that America, Americanism, uh, cannot be considered in any way, shape, or form a savior. Only Jesus Christ is our savior. 
So we are not talking about some golden age utopia where Amer uh, Americans everywhere knew the Lord and the earth was as full of the knowledge of the, of the Lord as the waters cover the sea on this continent. That's not the way it was. We are not talking about a golden age utopia. Secondly, it does not mean that there was an absence of conflict back then over the same issues that confront us today. Since the fall, the antithesis is always present. Unbelievers today have examples of unbelief to point back to them, just as we have examples of faithfulness to point to. We can look at our brothers and sisters who were faithful at that time, and people who are being unfaithful today can point to people who were unfaithful at that time and who were dishonest and trying to manipulate and do their thing. The, the, the culture wars that, that have been much talked about in recent years in America are, are not recent. All right? They are not recent. And uh, we just heard in the previous talk that there was a fundamental and profound cultural divide on basic ethical assumptions between Great Britain and the United States, was, which was very true. But there was also that same sort of divide um, among the Americans. Now, the, the godly Americans, those who wanted to serve God and Christ, had the upper hand. But there were Americans and Americans who supported the war effort against the crown who were on the other side of things. A good example of that kind of revolutionary firebrand would be someone like Thomas Paine. Thomas Paine was a harbinger of what was to come. Thomas Paine wanted the American Revolution to be like the French Revolution. Right? He was, and he was a, a staunch advocate of American independence, and he advocated it openly, and, and, and his work was very popular with many Americans. But there were also many Christian writers and thinkers and preachers who were very, very suspicious of men like Thomas Paine. So I don't want to pretend that among the Americans, among the colonists, among those who were fighting Great Britain, that there was no divide. Third, I don't want to, I have no intention of giving in to the hagiographic tendency to airbrush out all the warts. Sin is defined by the word of God and not by red, white, and blue bunting. Um, one of the things that this expression of, of uh, pain at warts and all was uh, something Oliver Cromwell, who had physical and policy warts to, to deal with, um, at, 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 at least had this going for him. I believe he was an honest and conscientious, well-intentioned Christian man. And when his um, painter was going to paint him, uh, Cromwell told him, I want you to paint everything, warts and all. I want you to paint me the way I am, not the way... Uh, subsequent generations would like to think I am. So basically, as, as when we talk about the Swamp Fox, uh, Francis Marion, uh, we'll talk a little bit about par a gentleman named Parson Weems, who um, w was a hagiographer. Uh, um, hagiography is um, writing about the saints, basically. And when you write saints' lives, what oftentimes happen, ha what happens is that you write about this person who was so great and good and godly that he never quite touched down. He, he never, he walked, hovered, hovered would be a better word. He didn't walk. He hovered above the ground, two inches above the ground. He didn't sin. He could not tell a lie. He chopped down the cherry tree. And, you know, that, that sort of thing, that kind of hagiography is not what the Bible gives us. Lives of the saints, medieval lives of the saints, oftentimes gives us hagiography. But if you want to look at the Bible, Jesus, uh, Jesus aside, who really was perfect, when you look at the apostles and the prophets and all the behavior, all the wards of God's people throughout all scripture, we have no encouragement to hagiography in scripture. This means that there will be honest, when you look at a conflict like the American War for Independence, there will be honest, conscientious, God-fearing men on the other side, and there will be scoundrels on your side. You know, that, that's the way it is. And you're going to have dissolute people on their side and, and honest, conscientious, God-fearing men um, on your own. And when you're making a decision of going to war or uh, heading into a conflict, the question you have to ask yourself is, when you're looking at your side, who's got the upper hand? Are the scoundrels running the show? Or uh, are the good guys running the show? You, but you're never going to get a utopian army, a utopian movement, where there are no scoundrels on your side. But last, I don't intend to allow the postmodern debunkers who, uh, who want to slander all of our founding fathers and represent what was, generally speaking, great faithfulness and sacrifice. 
as some sort of spiritual apathy, unbelief, or pretended neutrality. There is a hagiographic tendency among some rah-rah, red, white, and blue types to pretend that the founding fathers were perfect, all of them, infinitely wise, all of them, and so on. There, there is that hagiographic tendency, which we reject. But there is um, a far more prevalent tendency in our generation and our time to debunk in a cynical way every noble sacrifice, every noble achievement. And in this time period, there were significant, monumental accomplishments that we are um, the, beneficiaries, the beneficiaries of today. So we want to uh, guard against those things. I want to encourage you at the beginning to note that we are not engaging in hagiography, but we're not going to go along with the popular, very common tendency to, to, deb to debunk. So let's consider some background. Have you ever had the experience of reading through portions of the Old Testament, the book of Judges, for example, only to find yourself exasperated at how often and easily the Israelites fall away? God delivers them, the great deliverance, spectacular battle, spectacular deliverance. They are established, restored, everything is wonderful. And then when you've barely turned the page, there they are again, in tomorrow morning's quiet time, falling into idolatry again. How could they do that? You barely turned the page. <laughs> you know, they call out to the Lord, and the Lord delivered them. Flip. And <laughs> Hey, a golden calf, I listen. You barely turn the page. But please realize that there are places in your Old Testament where two pages turned represent the entire span of our nation's history. Two pages, two centuries, right? It, there's a, an awful lot of time elapsing here when you flip the page, and, and you can see how much can happen to a people and their collective national memory in two centuries. Our, what, what has happened to our memory of what God did for us in our nation's founding. Well, how long ago was that? It wasn't that long ago. We ought not to be exasperated with them unduly, for we are in the midst of the very same sin right now. We're doing the same thing as we speak. It makes a difference whether Moses or Jeroboam writes the history curriculum. It makes a difference whether Moses or Jeroboam writes the history curriculum. Our nation's founding was, that, was not that long ago ago. And there are different ways to illustrate this, and some of you may have heard me illustrate this before, but I can't, I don't think we can uh, emphasize this point uh, too much. It is now, to, this year is 2005. All of us could um, perhaps know or could easily meet someone in your community who is 100 years old, which means that that 100-year-old person was born in 1905. And that 100-year-old person, a newborn baby, could have been taken down to, the, uh, down to a local place in that town and placed on the lap of someone who was 100 years old. And that person was born in 1805, when Thomas Jefferson was president. Right? So one person and one person when Thomas Jefferson was president. It wasn't that long ago. Two long lifespans, and I'm only doing it in 100-year increments to make the math easier, because you can do it in 83-year-old increments and you get the same effect. A number of, uh, a few years ago, well, when I was a boy, when I was a 12-year-old boy in 1965, it was the centennial, all right, it was the centennial of the close of the war between the states in 1965. And I remember as a boy looking in the newspaper at a photograph of a reunion of people who'd been in the Confederate forces. Right, it's gathered on somebody's front porch somewhere, and they'd been drummer boys. Very, you know, they had been very young. They'd been they'd been there. Probably ought not to have been there. Um, way too young to have been there. But there were people still around who were um, who were present. When I was a boy, there were people that had been there in that conflict, or for whom it was a very recent event. I was uh, reading an article of a, a gentleman. I believe he lives in in uh, the Nashville area now. His name is John Tyler. I was reading an interview with him uh, some years ago, and at the time, this was uh, 10, 15 years ago probably, uh, at the time he was in his 50s or 60s, and he was the son of a man who had begotten him when his dad was in his 80s. Right? So dad was in his 80s, and this 
middle-aged businessman had been begotten. And the weird thing about this was that this had happened twice in a row because his dad had been begotten when his father was in his 80s. And the grandfather was President Tyler of the United States. So President Tyler of the United States, who was president before the war between the states, had begotten a son in his 80s, who had begotten a son in his 80s, and that grandson was this man who's alive now in the Nashville area. And this man, John Tyler, said in the interview he really enjoyed one time he was on a trans-Pacific flight uh, going to do business somewhere, flying across the Pacific, and he turned to the seatmate next to him and said, you know, as my grandfather was saying to his good friend Patrick Henry, Now, what I want you to get is that it wasn't that long ago, all right? It was just two flips of the page, all right? And we're doing exactly what the Israelites did. It is very easy to forget everything that's important, of, uh, everything of central importance in a brief uh, space of time. And this indicates, incidentally, why covenant education and nurture is so absolutely critical, because if you don't tell your children what happened, they don't know. If you don't teach your kids, they won't know. When someone comes up to you and says, these are the gods who brought you up out of the land of Egypt, you have to recognize that this is not just an abstract theological claim. It is also a historical claim. It's not just a theological claim. When they come up to you and say, here's an idol, would you worship it? And you, you know, you, you, no, I'm not supposed to do that. That's a theological claim, but it's a direct theological claim. But if they say, these are the gods that brought you out of Egypt, that's a historical claim as well. And you might know enough to realize that at the present, that the present pressing claims of the idolaters must be resisted. But suppose they did not attack you directly. Suppose the statement was not that you should start worshiping idols, but rather that Moses was an enlightenment figure and that Joshua was a deist. They didn't ask you to do anything. Didn't ask you to bow down, didn't ask you to burn incense, didn't ask you to do anything with the golden calf. They just said, you know, informed scholarship holds that Moses was influ greatly influenced by the French Enlightenment and that Joshua was a secret deist. These are historical claims, and they are being advanced for a reason. Now what? If someone says, well, Moses might have been a deist, a respectable scholarly opinion holds that he was a deist, and you say, huh, you know, What's happening to you? You are being outmaneuvered. That's what's happening to you. They're not going to walk up to you one day and say, hey, I know you've been faithfully serving Yahweh. I know that you've been worshiping the true God of the Bible. Why don't you throw all that overboard and bow down to this idol right now? They're, the devil's clever enough not to do that to you, it's clever not, enough not to do a frontal assault every time. He says, well, you know, it's more complicated than that. You know, things are kind of messy back then when they were coming out of Egypt. And there was a lot of, there were a lot of theological currents. And, and pretty soon, after two or three generations of that, everybody who brought you out of the land of Egypt was a deist. And you can point to the golden calf and say, this is the God, these are the gods who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And what is happening is you're having a theological um, seduction being run on you under the cloak of historical claims. We are exactly in that position. We are precisely in that position. Consider some of the following. The American War for Independence was a religious war. Now this, uh, let me uh, clear uh, some debris here. When we sit, when people say religious war, uh, a caricature of this comes to mind where you, you think of somehow um, one denomination in America going to General Assembly and getting inflamed and going home and getting their guns. And another denomination goes and gets their, and they go fight it out over some point of doctrine. Well, that's not how religious wars go. Even the most religious of wars, the Crusades, had all sorts of extra motivations. Uh, had to do with um, military threat and trade and uh, tourism. And, you know, all sorts of other issues were mixed in with um, the religious considerations. So when I claim that the American War for Independence was a religious war, of course I'm not saying that religious considerations or doctrinal considerations were the only things that were on people's mind. There were, all, there were many other issues involved, but religion, faith being the kind of thing that it is, it structures and orders your beliefs about everything else, taxes and, and so on. So let me just give you a few um, 
few things for you to throw under the hopper. Horace Walpole, who was mentioned in the previous talk, in the English Parliament, speaking of John Witherspoon, uh, the clergyman uh, who taught it, uh, who taught many of our founding fathers, including Madison. Um, John Witherspoon was also probably a descendant of John Knox. Walpole, speaking of Witherspoon, said that Cousin America has run off with the Presbyterian parson. How do we account for this independence? Cousin America has run off with the Presbyterian parson, speaking of Witherspoon. Witherspoon was enormously influential in his instruction and teaching. He was a Scot who had immigrated here, and I'll talk more about that later, but he was a um, very influential academic, taught many of our founding fathers, and, and was just uh, profoundly influential. At Yorktown, at the conclusion of the War for Independence, at Yorktown, all of George Washington's colonels, with one exception, were Presbyterian elders. Not only were they Presbyterians, but they were elders in Presbyterian churches, all of his colonels, with one exception. Over half the soldiers in the Continental Army were Presbyterian, over 50%. And the rest of the army were other kinds of Calvinists. Okay, so you had an army that was overwhelmingly Calvinistic, and over half of it was Presbyterian. The British army, during the course of the fighting, the British army specially targeted Presbyterian churches because they knew that they were in the thick of it. They did this because the black regiment was so effective through the sermons, through preaching and exhorting the troops and so on, was so effective in supporting the war. So the British army would either destroy churches or, or convert them into stables for their horses or that, that kind of thing. So they, and they particularly singled out Presbyterian churches for this treatment. We call it the American Revolution. We call it uh, the American War for Independence. One of the names for the war in England was the Presbyterian Revolt. That was one of the names in England, the Presbyterian Revolt. As was mentioned in the previous talk, the single biggest controversy in the colonies before the war was whether or not the king was going to appoint an Anglican archbishop over all of the colonies. That was the, the more paper, more ink, more pamphlets, more hubbub, more uh, polemical hostility was generated over that than any other issue between the crown and the colonies was the possible appointment of an Anglican archbishop. You were taught that the war was over tea, right? It makes a difference whether Jeroboam or Moses writes the history curriculum. Many wars have rallying cries. Some of them may be less than accurate, historically speaking. Uh, Remember the Maine was, for example, the, the rallying cry for the Spanish-American War uh, was Remember the Maine. The, the USS Maine was blown up in Havana Harbor and sank. Um, subsequent, we subsequently found out that it was not sunk by the Spanish. It was, it was a, apparently an explosion from within the ship. And, but uh, we were aching for a fight with Spain anyway, and... There was this thing, uh, the USS Maine sank in Havana Harbor. And so Remember the Maine was the rallying cry for the Spanish-American War. Uh, and, of course, in the Second World War, Remember Pearl Harbor. That's the rallying cry. What was the great rallying cry in the American War for Independence? The rallying cry was no king but Jesus. No king but Jesus. In a letter to home, one American Tory wrote the following. Quote, I fix all the blame for these extraordinary proceedings upon the Presbyterians. They have been the chief and principal instruments in all these flaming measures. They always do and ever will act against government from that restless and turbulent anti-monarchical spirit which has always distinguished them everywhere. Close quote. Now, the slander aside, I don't think that is true, that the Presbyterians were anarchists, uh, 18th century anarchists. I think it was a slander, but I think it's clear that he fixed the responsibility on the right group. The, historic, the historian Bancroft said, the revolution of 1776, so far as it was affected by religion, was a Presbyterian measure. After the war, George Washington, who was an Anglican, 
and this is important, he was an American Anglican, and there was a difference between uh, those American Anglicans who were patriots and who were affected by the predominant ethos of the other Christian denominations and uh, the Anglican Church in England. In England, the church was established, had all the power they uh, needed. The church was di- didn't have the same authority here, and so consequently there was more give and take. And George Washington was an Anglican who supported the uh, colonial cause. And after the war, uh, George Washington donated $40,000 in 18th century terms, which would have been a considerable sum, donated $40,000 to establish a Presbyterian college, which uh, became uh, Washington College. Why would an Anglican plant a Presbyterian college? Well, I think going back to all of his colonels and his soldiers and the men he led, he basically had an Anglican at the head of a Presbyterian army. That's what he had, an Anglican at the head of a Presbyterian army. And I believe that George Washington was simply so grateful for all the sacrifice that had been uh, uh, poured out by the Presbyterians at this time that, um, th- that he just expressed that gratitude by this donation after the war. One other thing, um, the the Presbyterians were so involved in the war for independence that this helps explain the religious history of America after the war. Uh, What happened after the war, at at the time, we had uh, Presbyterians, Anglicans, a handful of Baptists, um, and a handful of Catholics, and there were, of course, some uh, Quakers who were pacifists and not involved in the the fighting. There were no Methodists to speak of until after the war. The Baptists and the, the Presbyterians believed in a classical, classical Christian education. They believed in an educated clergy. They had a very rigorous system of educating uh, potential evangelists and clergymen and so forth, and it was not something you could just do in a day. Um, but what happened after the war, as the colonists poured over the Appalachian Mountains and started heading west, the demands of the frontier and the independence of individual pioneers on the frontier and the difficulty of getting educated men to just go off and in, in, into the woods and, uh, and not have anybody to work with sort of set up a system where itinerant preaching, the, the Methodists, uh, in a very real way, rose to the occasion. The Baptists did also. And part of the reason for the dominant uh, religious ethos was after the war, the Presbyterians were so beat up by the war, they had to go back home, re- uh, uh, rebuild their churches, which had been attacked by the British. They had to deal with the fact that so many of their men were dead because they'd been they'd borne the brunt of the fighting. And so they were sort of in a, uh, let's retrench, uh, try and rebuild and try and recover ourselves. And the Methodists and the Baptists and others poured over, you know, poured into the Western territories, and there was a real uh, ornery cussedness that uh, attended the uh, frontiersmen at this time that was not conducive to civilized behavior, let us speak kindly. There was one frontiersman, uh, and this this became pronounced during the, the age of Andrew Jackson, the rise of American populism in the early uh, 19th century. But there was one frontiersman who put it this way. He said, when I gets to fight and bar, I feels mighty numerous. Right? That was sort of the, uh, the can-do, I, I can fight anything, I can do anything, and I can do it all by myself. And so the first camp meeting uh, American revivalism uh, in its modern form burst out in Kentucky in 1799, and sort of the radical individualism began to spread. But that was not the way it was Prior to um, uh, the, prior to the close of the American War for Independence, back to the war. May twentieth, seventeen seventy five, was the date of the Mecklenburg Declaration in North Carolina. And the Mecklenburg Declaration, you may not know, was a full declaration of independence from the Crown. The Mecklenburg De- Declaration declared independence from England a full a, a year before the July fourth. Uh, Declaration of Independence, which was, of course, penned by Thomas Jefferson and which, of course, was uh, done by all the colonies together. The Mecklenburg Declaration was just a local Declaration of Independence. But it's interesting that the language of Jefferson's Declaration of Independence is clearly dependent upon the Mecklenburg Declaration. It's very clear that when... um, Jefferson turned in his draft of the Declaration of Independence, and then it came back with changes from the Continental Congress, 
Um, and, and Jefferson went back and, and made corrections to the corrections. He put phrases back in to the declaration that had originally been there. And those phrases that he corrected are phrases that come from the Mecklenburg Declaration. Uh, Washington, uh, excuse me, Jefferson is very, cl very clearly had a copy of the Mecklenburg Declaration when he was um, drafting the Declaration of Independence. But where did Mecklenburg uh, come from? Where did the Mecklenburg Declaration, Declaration come from? Well, it was the work of 27 oatmeal eating Calvinists. And this was the kind of oatmeal that they brought from Scotland, the kind where you mix broken glass in with it. <laughs> These were, these were ornery. These guys were ornery. A third of whom, uh, but a third of these 27 men who wrote the Mecklenburg Declaration were ruling elders in the Presbyterian Church. They were just, uh, this is where it came from. One Hessian officer, writing home during the war, said this, Call this war by whatever name you may, only call it not an American rebellion. It is nothing more or less than a Scotch-Irish Presbyterian rebellion. Nothing more, nothing less. That's what this is. A fair reading of the sources would indicate that John Calvin, mediated through John Knox, was the virtual founder of the United States. John Calvin, mediated through John Knox, was the virtual founder of the United States. The Treaty of Paris, you, the, when, you, when, when you talk about America's Christian origins, its Christian founding, the overwhelming Christian ethos of um, our founders, out of, when the, at the Constitutional Convention, there were 55 men there. 50 of the 55 were members of Orthodox Trinitarian churches. They were Orthodox Trinitarian Christians, members in good standing. That's where this came from. The Treaty of Paris, well, when you talk about this, many times people will bring up the Treaty of Tripoli, which was a treaty with the Barbary pi Pirates in 1797, and there was another form of it in 1805, and there was a, a phrase in the Treaty of Tripoli that says uh, um, that the United States is in no sense a Christian nation, and contemporary secularists make uh, much of this, but the uh, There'll be more about this in, in a moment, but basically with the Treaty of Tripoli, it's significant that the 1805 version doesn't have that language in it. It's significant that in the 1797 version, the Arabic copy of the treaty for the Muslims doesn't have that phrase in it. And the man who translated the phrase from the Arabic version into the English version was a man named, I think, Joel Barlow, something like that. And he was, had spent much time in France and was, and was affected by the Enlightenment and I think had his own agenda to advance and got that treaty in that form signed. It was signed not by George Washington, but by John Adams. But when it was done again in 1805, that phrase was taken out, I think, significantly. Somebody, some bureaucrat, some officials probably said, hey, did you see... Did you see what you signed? Did you see what this is in here? And the reason for bringing this up is that the Treaty of Paris was the treaty that concluded hostility between Great Britain and the United States. The Treaty of Paris concluded the fighting between Great Britain and the United States. The Treaty of Paris begins with these words, in the name of the holy and undivided trinity. Two nations coming together to agree to the cessation of hostility, and they make this covenant, this treaty, in the name of the holy and undivided trinity. Now, the lion's share of the rebel ranks, the lion's share of the rebel ranks were filled up with the Scots and the Scots-Irish, whom I referred to earlier. This is not to take away from the contribution made by the others. The Huguenots, um, we're going to hear that Francis Marion was a Huguenot, um, and... Uh, Dr. Lilbach is going to be addressing the Huguenot contribution. There were great contributions made by English Puritans who uh, came to New England and so on. And so there were many other contributions. But for various historical reasons, having to do with gross mistreatment by the House of Hanover, the King's George, King's, King George I, II, and III, they were the House of Hanover from Germany and were not really English. And the House of Hanover um, uh, cruelly oppressed the Scots and the Scots-Irish. The Scots-Irish had been trans were Scots who were transplanted to Northern Ireland under the reign of King James I, which was the, the sort of platonic form of the bad idea. You know, uh, I know, let's, 
let's take a bunch of Scottish Calvinists and take them over to this staunch uh, Irish Catholic place and <laughs> and give Margaret Thatcher some a real headache, you know, 400 years later. Well, the House of Hanover, on the 4th of July, when, uh, when we gather all our grandkids up to our place and we set off fireworks, whenever there's a particularly good um, firework, the, the kids yell things like, um, uh, down with King George and... and and, uh, and I hope as they grow older, they'll begin including, including references to the House of Hanover. The House of Hanover, the King's George, cruelly oppressed the Scots and the Scots-Irish. The Scots-Irish in Northern Ireland and Ulster in that area, and the uh, Scots in, um, in Scotland, they arrived, it, it was during this period, pr- right prior to the American War for Independence, in the generation prior, um, where the mistreatment of the Scots and the Scots-Irish by the House of, uh, by the House of Hanover uh, resulted in many, many thousands of Ulster Scots and Scott Scots uh, coming over here. There had been a revolt against the House of Hanover in Scotland in 1745, the Rebellion of 45. And in this uh, rebellion, in this revolt, Bonnie Prince Charlie had, uh, in, a, in a crazy uh, attempt landed with a, a rowboat full of guys, just a handful of guys landed on the coast of Scotland and sort of wanted to reclaim the crown and um, because his house had been deposed and and um, and the House of Hanover was was running the show and Scots uh, discontent Scots flocked to Bonnie Prince Charlie and it was a uh, a spectacular re- revolt that was really scary for a time, but it was ruthlessly uh, put down it was it was um, done in by treachery, and in Scots military affairs, um, throughout all Scottish history, treachery is a high art form. So, um, and it goes all it goes all the way back. Well, the the rebellion under Bonnie Prince Charlie was brutally put down. The tartan, the the Highland plaids were outlawed. The, all, you know, a lot of uh, oppression. Approximately prior to the War for Independence, approximately one third of all the adult males in Ulster, in, in the Northern Ireland, uh, about one-third of them left and came here. Um, and many, many of the, of the Scots in Scotland fled also under the oppression of the British. And so when it came to things British, and this was just a few years prior, right? It's just a few years before. Um, these Scots arrived on these shores like a bear with a sore head. Well, how many bears with a sore head? Roughly, in the 60 or so years before the American War for Independence, about 600,000, right? About 600,000 irritated Scots came here. What could go wrong? (laughs) And their opinion of the English crown was exactly what might be expected from the heirs of William Wallace. They hadn't forgotten any of that stuff. Now, you've been taught by various means that the American War for Independence was a war over taxes or tea and so on. And it was, in part. Right? There was a Boston Tea Party, and there were th- these issues were there. It's not like the people are making these things up. But whatever makes us think that taxes are not a religious issue? Why, why do we think today that taxes are not a religious issue? Everything is a religious issue. Jesus Christ is Lord, Right? I was talking to a friend at church yesterday, and he said something I thought was quite profound. He said, there are two fundamental things that American Christians, the American church, needs to learn to say to our government. Stop the killing and stop the stealing. Stop killing and stop stealing. And if you do that, you will not be far from the kingdom of God. Taxes, money, these sorts of issues are, uh, under the lordship of Christ, they are a religious issue, are our colonial forefathers thought of them as such. So the idea that taxes are a purely secular issue would have astonished our founding fathers. And, but that's just a portion of the response. The conflict was fundamentally between the established Anglican Church in its English form and the various dissenting churches of America with the Presbyterians in the leadership position. So Presbyterians, probably after that the Congregationalists, uh, some Anglicans and Baptists. Even the American Anglicans, as I mentioned before, were much more like their fellow Americans than they were like their fellow Anglicans in England, at least those who got along, who were respected, men like uh, George Washington. All the political issues, 
church government, the meaning of representative government, and so on, were driven by basic doctrinal commitments. The whole form of government that was established, a representative republic, or the whole form of secular civil government, the representative, uh, the representative bottom-up representation, is a civil, a civic form of Presbyterian government. That's what it is, right? And it took on this uh, character not by accident. It's it um, the um, I'm, I want to say the first, maybe one of the first, I'll, I'll just hedge my best, one of the first, it may have been the first uh, Presbyterian General Assembly, was held the same year that the Constitutional Convention was, I think, in Philadelphia. Is that right? In Philadelphia. Uh, it, these things were all happening at the same time. So our fathers collided with the leaders of England because each side had a well-integrated worldview and one that encompassed everything. The Scots and the Scots-Irish had come here before the war in the hundreds of thousands. Their political theorists were men like John Locke, Algernon Sidney, Samuel Rutherford, and others. Samuel Rutherford was a, um, wrote the book um, Lex Rex, which, means, which is the law and the prince, or the law is king, depending on how you translate it. It could be the law is king or the law and the prince. Uh, Samuel Rutherford uh, was a commissioner, Scottish commissioner, to the Westminster Assembly in the mid-17th century. And he got in a great deal of trouble with the political English authorities because of his writing this book, Lex Rex. In fact, near the end of his life, um, uh, Rutherford was summoned to appear before some commissioners of the crown. He was, he was being called on the carpet for, for some of his views. And while he was obeying the summons and going to um, this appointment to meet with the king's commissioners, he grew ill on the way and was at an inn and looked like he was going to pass away, like he was going to die there and not be able to make his appointment. So he sent a message, uh, message on ahead to the commissioners that he was sorry to disappoint them, sorry he was not able to make his appointment, but he was going to go see another king uh, with whom there was no injustice. Got his... Um, last jab in before he departed. Before he departed. Samuel Rutherford um, basically laid down a hard, cold, concrete foundation of the rule of law, right? the rule of law that a private sinful men cannot manipulate to their own, um, their own designs. It's very interesting. Uh, Rutherford was um, uh, active in the, in the Westminster Assembly, and of course that was the time of Cromwell and the, and par the parliamentary battles. There was a man who was a friend of Rutherford's, who was a member of Parliament, and uh, he, uh, during that same time, he, an Englishman who was a friend of Rutherford's and was in the Parliament, and Rutherford used to spend time around the house, and there was a little boy who was in that household, and that little boy's name was John Locke. Right? John Locke uh, was a theorist of limited government. He was a Christian. He was an Arminian Christian, not Reformed, not Calvinistic, and had some doctrinal problems. But he was a, he was a theorist of limited government and was coming up with a number of um, things like that and was very influential in the colonies. Well, he, he had grown up in a home uh, that was dominated by these battles in England. Algernon Sidney was another political theorist, the, pol the political theorist in England of the Whigs. And uh, I mentioned earlier that Whigs uh, were probably originally came from uh, Scottish thugs and Tories came from Irish thugs. But Algernon si Sidney was a leading Whig theorist. And he said, what, is Whig, what, is, what does the phrase Whig, W-H-I-G, mean? He says it meant we hope in God. Right? That's, what, that's what Whig means, we hope in God. Well, let me just leave you with a few other considerations. In 1778, in the middle of the war, a Presbyterian minister named Jacob Green preached a sermon at Hanover, New Jersey. So this is in the middle of the fighting. That day, being appointed as a day of public fasting and prayer throughout the United States. So the civic authorities had declared this day a, a, a day of prayer and fasting and were basically urging ministers and so on, so on to lead their people uh, in a day of humiliation, repentance of sin, um, that sort of thing, which, which these ministers at the time took very seriously. 
And I, I, I want to just give you a small excerpt of this, uh, from this message preached by Jacob Green. This is the kind of message, this is the kind of preaching that was very, very common. Jacob Green. When we view our contest with Britain, we appeal to the justice of God with courage and confidence. By Britain, we are abused, oppressed, most cruelly treated. We have been forced into this war. Liberty and other common rights of mankind we desired. These were denied. The most abject submission to unreasonable terms has been urged upon us. We cannot so meanly, so basely submit. We are contending for liberty. Our cause is just, is glorious, more glorious than to contend for a kingdom, a cause on which we may hope for a divine blessing. Though our contention with Great Britain is so glorious, yet have we reason to be humbled and abased before God. We have reason to be humble and mourn for the many sins, the many vices that prevail among us. God has a controversy with us. How very different from that of Great Britain. God most righteously contends and corrects us for our sins. In this case, we have reason to submit, repent, and reform. Britain contends and threatens ruin. In this case, we justly vindicate ourselves and ought most vigorously to exert ourselves in a proper defense. I have always had the firmest belief that we should prevail in our contest with Britain. But I have always thought and often told you that God would scourge us for our sins. What son is there whom the father chastens not? Tis common for God to correct his people when working deliverance for them. Notice what he's doing. This is, this is not a go team go, rah rah, sis boom ba sort of patriotism. What is he saying? In our, con- in our contest with Britain, we are right and they are wrong. They are oppressing us. They are mistreating us. This is tyranny. And we are right and just to take our stand against them in this feel in, in this arena of human relations. We are in the right, they are in the wrong. At the same time, we recognize fully that we are sinners. It's, there's no sense of American sep- exceptionalism like the British are orcs and we are angels. There's no... Uh, uh, James Madison said later that if men were angels, uh, governments would not be necessary. There was a very clear awareness on the American side of their own faults and failings and sins. It's a... Uh, It's also interesting that he goes on, later in the message, he goes on and specifies what those sins are. He goes through and names all the things that the Americans were guilty of doing and does this in the midst of God is delivering us. He's led us into this conflict. We are in the right. He will deliver us. I have every confidence that he will do so. But as he does so, he's not going to leave us and our sins alone. God is going to sift us. God's going to deal with us. I said earlier that... The United States was and is a covenant nation. We are misled and ill-instructed on many things. We, people say, but the First Amendment, the, the First Amendment says Congress shall make no law concerning the establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. What, wait, wait, what was that last part? Or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. The reason we think that the First Amendment is a problem in this in this respect, is because we don't understand what a federal republic is. If we understood what a federal republic is, we wouldn't have this problem. If, for example, Maryland chooses as its state bird the Oriole, and the United States chooses as its national bird the bald eagle, this creates no conflict at all. All right? Nobody ever got in a serious quarrel of, over something like that. Every state can have its state flower, and we can have our national flower, and everybody still gets along. State bird, national bird, you know, whatever you want. But it would cause a problem if there was a church of the United States, and it was a different church than the church of Virginia, the church of Massachusetts, the church of Connecticut, and so on. At the time of the adoption of the, of the Constitution, Out of the 13 colonies that approved the Constitution, nine of the 13 colonies had established state churches. Nine of the 13 had formal, your tax dollars would go to the Church of Virginia, which was Anglican, uh, the Church of Maryland, which was Anglican, the Church of Connecticut, which was congregational. The congregational church was not disestablished in in Connecticut until in the 1830s. There was nothing whatever unconstitutional about the the local 
uh, states having an established recognition of the Trinitarian faith at, at the root of their, uh, at the foundation of their law. And nine of the 13 colonies had done it, you know, explicitly with a, a particular church as their church. There were, um, States like Delaware that just, just simply said uh, established the Protestant religion generally. They, they just affirmed the truth of the Protestant uh, religion. Our nation at its founding was a covenant nation. That means it still is. All the unbelief, all the court decisions, all the all the federal judges saying nah, uh, all right, all right. We don't think that. We don't believe that. That's your opinion. All that, all that means, what that constitutes is covenant breaking. That, that's, they're covenant breaking. But in order to be a covenant breaker, there's got to be a covenant there to break and, and a covenant there to insult. And that's what, that's what our current judicial system is doing. That's what our current executive branch is doing. That's what the current uh, legislative branch is doing. By giving um, uh, all the insults that they are giving to the Trinitarian faith of our fathers, this does not release them from their obligation. Any more than turning two pages in the book of Judges releases the Israelites from their obligation to remember what had happened 200 years before. We are as much under obligation to remember what happened 200 years ago as the Jews were under obligation to remember what happened 200 years ago. It is very important for us to realize that time does not erase Commitments, generations do not erase covenant obligations. Disobedience does not erase obligation. The United States was a Christian federal republic in its founding, and consequently it still is. We have a long way to go before we can bring a covenant lawsuit, as the prophets of of old in the Old Testament would do. They would bring a covenant lawsuit to their people. And this is because in the church... We have lost the notion of covenants as well. We don't have any more idea of this than the pagans do. We serve Jesus privately in our hearts and privately in our own little denominations, but we don't have any notion of covenant interconnectedness either. And this is something that we must recover. And as we recover it, you're going to discover that there, the, the evidence of our Christian founding, the evidence of our Christian beginnings, the evidence of our Christian covenantal commitments are overwhelming. There's no dispute. There's no, uh, there's no way to argue. But th there is dispute nonetheless. There are people who will continue to fight this, but only because they don't want this Jesus to rule over them. Let's thank God together. Father, we do thank you for your goodness and kindness to us. I pray that as we meditate on these things, that you would um, give us tender hearts as we look for uh, ways to apply and things to do, things that you would call us to. We thank you in Jesus' name and amen. Thanks for listening to this week's edition of the All of Christ for All of Life podcast. That was a message from our audio collection titled The Black Regiment. If you'd like to hear the rest of the talks, you can purchase them at canonpress.com audio.